we wait just a minute to get started. Welcome everybody. We'll take just a minute to get started. Let everybody sign on. Hi everyone. Okay, we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is The Bald Eagle, The Improbable Journey of America's Bird with author Jack E. Davis. Hi, Jack. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course. My name is Riley Davenport and I'm an educator and raptor specialist here at Hawk Mountain. And we are so glad that everyone is here joining us today virtually. Um, just a little bit of background on Hawk Mountain before we begin. So Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. And Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you so much for your continued support. And if you are joining us today and you are not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone is remaining healthy and safe during these times of COVID challenges. And we are excited to offer local and global um, our community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, we greatly appreciate and depend on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded, but if you're interested in checking it out at a later date to use as a future resource, we will be uploading it to our YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out. If at any time during today's program, you have a question for Jack, you can submit it below at the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we've saved some time at the end of the program to answer some of those questions. Um, all righty, so we are so excited that Jack is joining us today to talk about his awesome book about the bald eagle. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to share a little bit of background information on the book that we will be discussing today. So Pulitzer Prize winning author Jack Davis will discuss his new book, A Sweeping Cultural and Natural History of the Bald Eagle in America, taking us from before the nation's founding through inconceivable resurgences of the enduring all-American species. Jack Davis contrasts the age when native peoples lived beside this raptor peacefully when others, whether through hunting bounties or DDT pesticides, twice pushed the eagle to the brink of extinction. Filled with spectacular stories of founding fathers, rapacious hunters, heroic bird rescuers, the lives of bald eagles themselves, and even the history of Hawk Mountain, the bald eagle is a much awaited cultural and natural history that demonstrates how this bird's wondrous journey may provide inspiration today as we gravel, grapple with environmental peril on a larger scale. So Jack, once again, thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to, before I hand it over to you to talk about the book, could you tell us a little bit more about the book you wrote that received the Pulitzer Prize? That's really, that's really amazing. Yes, that book was The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea. And uh, it's a, an environmental history of the Gulf of Mexico from uh, focusing on the five U.S. states uh, from geological formation to the, to the present. And uh, in, as an environmental writer, I like to bring nature to the forefront, obviously. And, but um, not only that, I like to show it as a historical agent, as, as a really shaping force in, in human history. Um, so in other words, uh, we're not in full control of our, of our history and, or, or our destiny. And so um, uh, I've organized that book around natural characteristics of the Gulf of Mexico, birds, fish, um, beach, um, uh, rivers, uh, weather, uh, and, um, uh, and of course, oil is only a small part of that history. I didn't want oil uh, or even hurricanes to, uh, to overwhelm the story of the Gulf of Mexico. It's much larger, much more interesting than just uh, oil spills and, and devastating hurricanes. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for sharing and congratulations. Yeah. That's a very prestigious yeah, thanks. award. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm going to um, mute myself and turn off my video and you have the floor to get started whenever you're ready. Okay, great. I'm going to um, put up some images 
and um, and I'm hoping that um, you're seeing a cover of the book. Is that right, Riley? Yep, I can see it. Okay, there. okay, good, good. And uh, so I wanted to start by by telling you, sharing with you why I I decided to write this book. Um, after I finished the Gulf of Mexico book, um, I of course wanted to write another uh, book on the environment, and the and I wanted to write something a little different from your usual uh, in, environmental or, or nature book. When we reflect on our past and environmental uh, record or relationship uh, or our relationship with the environment, we we tend to focus on. And writers are guilty of this, as anybody. Uh, we tend to focus on the, the, the grim and the tragic. And uh, I wanted to give readers a break from that. So I wanted to tell a, an environmental success story. This is not to say that the, the grim and the tragic doesn't de deserve its attention, um, but I, I think there's, there's room for an alternative. And, and this is also not to say that the bald eagle's um, history with the uh, United States uh, is doesn't have its grim and tragic moments, but it also has some really, I think, um, bright uh, re redeeming moment, moments and um, the, the birds moments in its relationship with with the uh, with the American people. Uh, I also wanted to, and, and the bald eagle story is really uh, uh, particularly in the late 20th and early in 21st century is a, is, a, is an extraordinary environmental success story. So I wanted readers to have uh, something that um, perhaps uh, offered some positive reinforcement as we as we face uh, continuing challenges, environmental challenges in the 21st century. Uh, we did something right uh, in the past. We can we can do it again, and more than just with the bald eagle. But I also wanted to write a an environmental story that could reach across, you know, reach a broad audience across the. The you know the political uh, divide in in our country, and and the bald eagle seemed like you know the really the the perfect uh, subject for that. I mean, who doesn't love the bald eagle? Whether you're red, white, and blue American, or a birder, or a tree hugger, or all of those in one. Um, you know, when you when we see a bald eagle crossing the sky, it's it's one of those poke the guy in, in the ribs next to you moments. You know, you, uh, you point up to the sky and uh, you squeal or, or you grunt or whatever. You, 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 you get excited to see the bald eagle. And, um, and when I started writing this book, I, wasn't, I didn't know a lot about bald eagles. I grew up in Florida, but I, I grew up at a time when they, they just weren't around. Um, there were very few bald eagles, very few osprey. Uh, in fact, I never saw ospreys in the Tampa Bay area where I grew up or bald eagles until the uh, 80s for ospreys and 90s for, for, for bald eagles. Uh, that's because we had nearly killed the bay um, and, and the seagrass disappeared, the fish disappeared. And when that happens, of course, the birds disappear. And the bald eagle's primary uh, food source is, is fish. It's, it's, it's in the sea eagle genus. And But I didn't know much about the bald eagle when I started writing this. And this book, and uh, I discovered some really interesting things. One of the first interesting things is, I think we're all familiar with the story of um, uh, Ben Franklin complaining, comparing the bald eagle with the, uh, with the, with the turkey, or keep comparing the morality, as he said, of the two birds, uh, and uh, and concluding that the bald eagle was um, is is it was this dishonest thieving. Uh, there's just this rank coward, as, as he said, and uh, whereas the uh, the osprey was a hardworking and, and, and noble bird, and and as the story goes, he um, um, of course he uh, 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 people understand that he opposed the bald eagle as uh, uh, as a, as a national symbol or the national bird, and uh, and that he proposed the osprey. Excuse me, not the osprey. The the turkey for the national seal and to be uh, the national bird. Well, that's only half true. Um, he did compare the morality of those two birds uh, in a letter to his daughter, uh, but he never advocated the turkey uh, for the national seal or for national bird. But the other misunderstanding is that 
we don't have a national bird. The United States does not have a national bird. Congress has never uh, appointed uh, any bird to that that post, if you if you will. And Congress has anointed a national mammal, the bison, a national tree, the oak, a national flower, uh, the rose, but it, it has never chosen a national bird. Um, but of course, Congress did put the um, front and chain my slides here. Here we go. That should do it. Uh, Congress did put uh, the bald eagle on the national seal. Uh, the other thing that I learned is that it took Congress a long time to come up with a uh, with a uh, what it considered a proper seal design. Six years, um, and finally, uh, this uh, design uh, was finalized in 1782. Um, three congressional committees failed to come up with uh, anything that was satisfactory. Uh, the very first committee was Jefferson, Adams, and, and uh, Franklin. You think those three uh, it would be a snap that those three would come up with a perfect design? Um, but what they came up with was uh, summarily rejected by by Congress. And and uh, and I won't tell you here what Franklin proposed for the seal um, because I want you to read the book. But that really surprised me. Um, and uh, so this design uh, essentially derives from Charles Thompson, who was the secretary of the Continental Congress. And uh, he uh, was desperate because uh, America was about to defeat the British and it had no national seal. And it had a flag, but it had no seal, it had no, no stamp, you know, official stamp to put on uh, a treaty or any of its other uh, um, documents. And so Thompson's the one who came up with the idea of putting the bald eagle on the national seal. Now, eagles have been present on national coats of arms uh, in seals dating back to, uh, the, to the ancient Greeks and, and, and the Romans. But those eagles are non-ornithological. They don't represent any specific species. Uh, this one, the bald eagle is the first one on a national seal to represent a particular species. And Thompson insisted that the eagle on the U.S. seal be a, an Amer as he called it, an American bald eagle. And he chose the right bird. I mean, the bald eagle is um, endemic to North America. It lives nowhere else. And it's also, you know, an easily identifiable bird um, with its white head and tail and dark body and its size. Uh, no other uh, eagle, there's some 60, I think 63 or 65 species of eagles worldwide. No other looks quite like the bald eagle. Um, and when you look at this, this bird, it has this, it's, it's very charismatic. Um, and it is, uh, uh, it's really, it really conveys the values or the ideals that America wanted to convey. Um, it, it wanted to show itself as strong, independent, you know, a free nation uh, and uh, of, of courageous people. Uh, and uh, it wanted to distinguish itself from European powers. And it did that with a native bird, um, but it also did with the, uh, the, the right bird. I mean, look at that, look at the countenance, that, look at the expression on that, you know, this permanent expression on the bald eagle. It has that perfect don't tread on me stare. Um, and that has a lot to do with the, the uh, orbital ridge above the eye of the bald eagle, that, that bony ridge above the bald eagle that gives it that don't tread on me stare. It's, for the bald eagle, it serves as a sun visor. Its eye is also uh, quite brilliant, striking. It's uh, nearly the size of, of an, adult, um, uh, may, uh, an adult human's eyes. And uh, so uh, I, I think Thompson did, uh, did uh, made the right choice. And the bald eagle was an instant hit as an image among the American people. You didn't see its image in a lot of places around uh, the country before the National Seal was adopted in 70, 1782. Um, but Americans started putting it on everything um, from, from um, uh, 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 creamware to the coins to uh, the uh, emblems and national government uh, to logos on businesses and sports teams uniforms. Uh, it's, uh, it became extremely popular. 
But what was not at the same time popular was the living bird itself, the species. It's an apex predator, um, as I'm sure you know. And it was treated in the late 18th and 19th century, throughout the 19th century on into the early 20th century as any other predator of the time, a wolf, a coyote, a bear, a mountain lion. Uh, uh, you know, uh, predators were to be shot because they were considered uh, to be, uh, to jeopardize uh, the, the American economy, you know, the, the livestock, uh, um, the uh, commercial hunting, and to be unnecessary competition. And so a bald eagle seen was a bald eagle to be shot. Uh, and it's, it's one of the ultimate paradoxes in American history. Here is this bird that it represents uh, you know, a free nation, yet it's being denied. The species itself was being denied its, its, its own freedom. Uh, and so they're being shot left and right, um, blown out of the sky. Newspaper reports never can, rarely ever condemned the shooting of an eagle. Instead, they reported on the wing size span, size of the wingspan, the weight of the bird out was shot. Uh, it was no different from reporting on somebody catching a big bass that summer, you know. Um, and so here's a picture, and people got their pictures taken with, um, with their quote unquote trophies. Uh, here's one from the 1930s. Uh, look at the, uh, you know, these guys, th this picture is in my book. I was just mesmerized by uh, the, the expressions on these three men's faces. Uh, and they're quite proud of themselves. And others were too. I mean, so by the, by the um, late 19th century, uh, the bald eagle um, was no longer seen in, in numerous states, particularly on the eastern seaboard. They were so scarce on the eastern seaboard where, where they had once been plentiful um, because uh, uh, and so scarce that um, people thought they, um, by the 1880s or so, thought bald eagles were Rocky Mountain birds. Um, they were rarely seen in Philadelphia, for, for example, where they were quite prominent. Um, on the uh, Delaware River, there was probably at the time uh, during the colonial period, uh, an eagle's nest every mile or two along the Delaware River because it was a very fishy river. Uh, and so uh, I, there were a number of myths that promoted the shooting of the bald eagle. They were accused, even by an ornithologist, uh, in, including Audubon, um, that, they, that bald eagles would carry away uh, calves and, and sheep and, and, um, uh, and pigs from uh, the livestock farms. A bald eagle can carry away a chicken, um, but it can't lift anything more than five pounds. And to get that, it really has to be moving. Uh, it, has, it has to have great momentum behind it. Bald eagles um, or eagles generally were accused of, of um, also kidnapping babies. Mothers were war not to leave their infants outside lest the bald eagle come along and, and steal it and take it back to its nest and feed it to its young. Um, McGuffey Reader, which was the most popular, next to the Bible, most read book of the day, a primer for immigrants learning to uh, speak and read English and, and children, had a story for decades about a bald eagle carrying away a child to its nest. And this is a, a, a still from an early, early Thomas Edison Studios film, uh, rescued from an eagle's nest um, and this prop eagle flying in on wired wires, uh, carries away this baby. Uh, this is a live baby. Um, also, you can see it's clearly wired up too. Uh, those are in the days before um, child actors had any sort of protections, obviously. Uh, and so this myth can uh, remain um, powerful uh, um, past the World War II. Uh, and so uh, by the late 19th century, early 20th century, the bald eagle was at, uh, at the brink of extinction in the lower 48 states. Now, the, the Americans' relationship with bald eagles was very different from the native relationship with, with bald eagles. For thousands of years, um, uh, many native uh, cultures uh, recognized the bald eagle as a spirit bird, a messenger bird, uh, a bird that would communicate uh, with, the, uh, with their uh, lost ancestors and, and the creator, a bird, uh, a bird that uh, flew close to heaven 
or to uh, heaven or to the spirit world. And so native peoples uh, in, in their culture, feathers or, or eagle feathers are extremely important. They're a conduit to uh, the, the, the spirit world and they're used in, in rituals and ceremonies. And, uh, and so uh, many native um, uh, societies had designated eagle hunters who would go out and uh, kill an eagle, just a few number uh, for their, uh, their body parts and their feathers. The Zuni this is a picture, 1879 picture of a Zuni um, at the Zuni Pueblo uh, in, uh, in uh, Arizona, New Mexico area. Uh, and the Zuni would actually take eaglets out of nests and raise them in these stockades uh, as shown in this picture. Uh, they wouldn't kill the eagles, but they would gather their feathers and, and when they molted, but also pluck them from time to time. Uh, and so it was a very different relationship um, with, with than that of uh, that of Americans. And so in the 20th century, early 20th century, when bald eagles were on the brink of extinction, and when, uh, by the way, the territory of Alaska had a bounty on bald eagles that ran from 1917 and 1952. And during that period, Alaska paid uh, uh, bounties on over 128,000 bald eagles. And I estimated throughout the 19th century uh, in the lower 48, um, uh, more than uh, Americans shot more, shot and poisoned and club, more than that, uh, probably 150 to 200,000 uh, bald eagles. Well, there were some, many people who were concerned about that. And one was Rosalie Edge. Uh, and uh, she, uh, uh, she and Willard Van Name, uh, who uh, founded the Emergency Conservation Committee together in response to National Audubon, which refused to take a stand in defense of the bald eagle, uh, regarding it like everybody else did as a predator that needed to be controlled. Audubon would not take a, a stand against the bald eagle bounty and this upset uh, Rosalie Edge. And that's one of the reasons why she started the uh, Emergency Conservation Committee. I love the name of the, uh, of the organization. And she, um, she and Willard Van Dam, uh, Van Dam and others uh, called for the protection of the bald eagle, lobbied the uh, um, Congress for the protection of the bald eagle, lobbied against the, the, um, the Alaska bounty. And finally, finally um, Congress in 1940 uh, passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act, uh, giving, making the bald eagle the, the first um, non-domestic species uh, to have uh, individual species to have its own law uh, of protection. Other other wildlife uh, uh, protective legislation um, focus on uh, numerous species, but the Bald Eagle Protection Act um, focused uh, or, or 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 actually covered only one species, and that that was the bald eagle. Um, so that was in 1940. When it happens five years later, DDT is released on the commercial market, uh, commercial and home, you know, home consumer market. And, uh, and it becomes an instant hit. And, it, and uh, before we know it, DDT is, you know, this coverlet over uh, the, the lower 48, uh, which devastates uh, fish populations, bird populations, animal populations in, in general. Here's a picture of Willard Van Name on Hawk Mountain, which I, I failed to show. Uh, and thank you uh, to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary for providing these pictures to me, which I, uh, which I use in my book. Uh, very much appreciate that. Um, and so DDT is, is blanketing America. It's killing off all this avian life and fish life. The bald eagle population, like other bird population, other raptor population, plummets. Uh, this man on top of this pine tree, Charles Broly, retired banker, from uh, Winnipeg, uh, retired to Tampa, Florida in the late 1930s, uh, began climbing trees to, to ban eagles. Nobody was doing this at the time. And he did this for 20 years until age 79. Um, and uh, he is uh, probably the first person who uh, noticed the, uh, the, the uh, precipitous decline of the bald eagle population in the 1950s. Um, and the first person to make a link between DDT and bald eagles. In fact, Rachel Carson in Silent Spring writes about Charles Broly. Um, uh, the other thing he did that was extremely important to science is that his banded eaglets, he banded um, 
over 1,200 eaglets in those, 12, uh, those 20 years. Um, they help science understand the migratory uh, patterns, which is really not a pattern um, um, uh, of, of bald eagles. They're very random the way bald eagles, um, uh, unlike other migrating birds, migrate. Uh, and this is a, another woman who was a champion of uh, bald, um, bald eagles after, and raptors generally, I should say, after the, um, the DDT was banned by the EPA in 1972, or at least the sale of BD, DDT in the United States was banned in 1972. Um, many people came out uh, to try to restore, began to work to restore the, ba uh, the bald eagle population, the, uh, uh, the uh, osprey population, the falcon population, all the raptor populations. And this is Doris Magger, who to bring attention to the plight of bald eagles, um, uh, rode her bike at age 60, uh, rode her bike across the United States from San Diego to Florida in, in uh, 1982, giving uh, talks in the parking lots of Kmart, which was her sponsor on this trip, and in schools, uh, talking about the importance of raptors to the environment. She traveled uh, with this, this bird, uh, George Washington, and uh, who, who traveled separately in a van, and, and an eagle she called um, E.T., E.T. for extra terrific. And uh, I interviewed Doris Magger in her 90s uh, a couple of years ago, and she was still going strong. Uh, she said as soon as COVID was over, she's going back out into the schools uh, to continue to talk about raptors. Um, the, eagle, the bald eagle restoration program was launched in the bicentennial, at least the, uh, the program um, that was overseen by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and also uh, state wildlife agencies was launched in the bicentennial year, 1976. Um, and it was a phenomenal success in restoring the bald eagle population. Uh, it had reached its nadir in 1963 under 500 nesting pairs across the United States. I should have mentioned that in 1952, um, the uh, actually in 1940, Congress had exempted uh, the territory of Alaska from the Bald Eagle uh, Protection Act, but in 1952, uh, remove that 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 uh, exemption, and but uh, so Doris Magger traveled all across the country, as did, as did many other people lecturing on bald eagles. She also started uh, a raptor rehabilitation program in the '70s, actually in the late '60s, uh, in in Florida. And this is a period in the late 20th century in which you see uh, raptor centers and rehab. Uh, programs emerging all across the, the, the country, and uh, uh, but also restorations all across the country. Uh, and the bald eagle, and I have to say that it wasn't only the restoration program, which was a phenomenal success in bringing the bald eagle back, but that restoration program, while it depended on dedicated wildlife people, it also depended on um, the uh, the, the really powerful domestic instincts of, of bald eagles to rebuild the population. Uh, here's an image of uh, a bald eagle, eagle company, take a couple taken not far from me here in Gainesville, Florida. And notice the, um, the Spanish moss in the talons of, the, of this eagle. Eagles mate for life uh, and uh, they maintain a fidelity to their nest for life as long as that nest exists. Uh, and if it's lost in a storm or for some other reason, uh, they'll uh, rebuild uh, almost usually immediately. And every year um, they leave their nest at the end of breeding season. The, the, the male goes off in one direction, the female goes off in another direction, and they meet up again at the nest the next season. And they, meet, they spend the first few weeks refurbishing the nest. And they're always adding onto the nest. The nest will get bigger year after year, in most cases, year after year after year. Um, and so this pair is um, um, refurbishing their nests in, in preparation of, of laying eggs. And bald eagles raise their, their young with such care that when the juveniles leave, or, or well, they, they fledge at around 12 weeks and then they leave the territory uh, around 16 weeks or so. And when they leave the territory, they've been fed so well by mom and dad um, that they typically weigh a bit more than, than mom and dad. 
Uh, and eventually those, those uh, juveniles will return to their natal territory uh, at four or five years old um, when, they're, when they've reached breeding, breeding age, um, which is, uh, has a lot to do with the restoration of the bald eagle and uh, throughout the country. And where it wasn't, where it, it had gone missing in the 1970s from numerous states, or at least nesting bald eagles. And um, so the bald eagle population by, uh, by 1999 was, uh, was at such a point that uh, the bald eagles were ready to come off the endangered species list, but um, bureaucratic inertia delayed delisting till 2007. The population, nesting population uh, at that time in the lower 48 was around uh, 10 to 11,000. In the 2010s, the decade of 2010s, the bald eagle population quadrupled. Today, it's around, in the lower 48, over 300,000, probably 500,000 continent-wide, which is equal to the estimated size of the bald eagle population at the time Europeans uh, 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 first began settling in, in North America. Phenomenal comeback, uh, a, a tremendous environmental success story. Um, I wanted to, before I uh, finish up here and uh, take uh, questions, I wanted to read in, uh, uh, just a couple of, uh, about three paragraphs from the book uh, to give you a flavor of the book, but also these paragraphs are about Hawk Mountain. So um, I thought you would enjoy that, which I visited uh, during, um, during COVID. I researched this book during COVID, but I unfortunately was able to visit um, Hawk Mountain in, uh, Hawk Mountain in um, uh, September 2020, and um, was so glad that I did. Skyward over Hawk Mountain on the Atlantic Flyway in Eastern Pennsylvania, something was happening, or rather something wasn't happening. Hawk Mountain has, had long been a favorite place to watch migrating raptors even when Theodore Palmer and T. Gilbert Pearson were testifying before Congress that bald eagles were non-migratory. I should point out when Congress was considering the Bald Eagle Protection Act, um, T. Gilbert Pearson was the president of the Audubon Society and Theodore Palmer, who was a vice president uh, and an ornithologist testified before Congress and maintained that the bald eagle was not a migratory bird uh, and therefore, uh, it could, should not be uh, receive federal protection from um, the government because uh, that would mean interfering in states' rights, that bald eagles belong to the individual states. And so the first two times that Congress considered the Bald Eagle Protection Act, uh, they voted it down based upon that, that argument. Finally, in 1940, uh, people got, um, of course, Rosalie Edge, and Willard Van Naam and so many others knew that they were migratory birds. Uh, and finally, in 1940, Congress uh, understood that fact too. Um, in utter defiance of that um, impaired assertion that they were non-migratory, hundreds of eagles flew along the Appalachian chains Hawk Mountain every fall, coming from New York and New England and disseminating themselves around the mid-Atlantic. They were interstate travelers on a highland thoroughfare which the native Lenape called the Endless Mountain. September was the best month to watch the voyagers, usually later in the day. Their numbers passing overhead were a sight to be seen, as too was their soaring flight. Looking up, one could understand why these formidable flyers evoked the reverence of native peoples, why they were hallowed birds. In native cultures, the mountain range was a sacred reach into spiritual heights and is wondrously alive as the migrating birds. In the natural realm, the mountain was no passive topographic mass either. It was a maker of air currents and the catalyst of flight. Wind combined with geography gave birds wherewithal. Soaring species are experts at locating moving air that will carry them on their respective journeys. Some currents rise from the earth's warming during the day, infusing the cool air above with uplifting thermals. Some currents come from two masses of air colliding from opposite direction. Some originate with horizontal wind careening into a hillside or mountainside and turning upward and into soarable lift as at the endless mountain. 
on prodigious wings, birds ascend on the vertical thrust and then drop into a shallow dive to gain momentum and to advance in the desired direction. Locating, locating another draft, they angle their wings ever so slightly to deflect the air beneath them downward and as an opposite reaction to this action, bear themselves upward against this, again to start the cycle over. And so they glided over and along Hawk Mountain, eagles, hawks, harriers, falcons, merlins, ospreys, vultures. They flew high, too high sometimes to be identified without a scope or binoculars, unless you had a trained eye or could make out an adult bald's exceptional white tail. Eagles and vultures, for example, are similar in size, shading and wingspan and can, and can confuse the naked and untrained eye. Along with the objects of their fascination, birders converged on a hawk mountain in the forest, testing their skills at identifying high flying raptors and taking in a thrilling view. The broad sky panorama at 1500 feet from ridge across valley, heavily forested and generously littered with glacial sandstone rocks and smelling of minerals and soil could stir an artist of the Schoolkill or Hudson River School into breaking out brushes and canvas. Some people, both men and women, broke out guns instead. Hawk Mountain was a popular den for recreational assassins with a, if it flies, it dies mindset, blasting away at the caravanners on ancient pilgrimages. There was no purpose to the violence outside of killing for the sake of killing and shooting for the sake of shooting. This was not predator control. The gunners were not hunters of food. The fallen were nothing more than a score to them, a pose for the camera, the sky, something to empty. Determined to put an end to this, this pointlessness, Rosalie Edge raised money to lease 1,400 acres on the mountain and hired a husband and wife wildlife warden team to hinder the guns. Four years later, after a heated struggle with National Audubon, which believed it should be the proprietor of Hawk Mountain, Edge bought the 1,400 acres with the, finance, with the financial support of Willard Van Name and many others. So why don't I stop there and um, take any questions folks might have. Awesome. Thank you so much. I do have a couple questions here. Okay. Um, so I will go through and start to read them. Um, the first question is from Earl, and he asks, do you know the average lifespan of the bald eagle? So the, the um, some people maintain that it'll live, bald, it'll, bald eagles will live longer in captivity, which is true with a lot of wild animals. Um, mm -hmm. they, uh, they have been known to live uh, in captivity up to 40 years. Um, the oldest bald eagle known to live in the wild um, was 38 years old when it, when it died. And uh, it was, uh, um, sadly, it was struck, struck by a car. Mm. All right, let's see here. Um, this question is, even though the book is about the bald eagle, this answer might be the bald eagle, might be something else. What is your favorite bird of prey? Oh, really? Did you really <laughs> ask that? You had to ask that question. Um, you know, I, I just really fell in love with the bald eagle and researching it, learning more and more about it. I would say before then, before the bald, uh, before I wrote this book, it was probably osprey. Um, and um, they're marvelous fishers, great parents, like like bald eagles, and um, and you just have to you just have to admire them. But you know, I I just really like the you know why don't I have to have a favorite? I like them all. Why don't we put it that way? I agree. <laughs> um, okay, let's see here. This one's a bit longer, but it is pretty interesting. This person asks, um, Janice asked, my dad volunteered as a counter at Hawk Mountain in the 1970s. And because of him, I've always had an affinity for birds of prey. I've been following the mated pair at the National Arboretum in Washington, D.C., Mm -hmm. And it's the mated pair. Their names are Mr. President and the First Lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they said, my question, somewhat tied to your comment about the random migratory patterns, was that last 
the last time they saw the first lady was when she tried to dive bomb a immature female bald eagle from the nest because she was fighting for um yeah her territory uh, for the territory and yeah. the and visitor, perhaps the mate perhaps the president perhaps the president exactly and they said yeah. the visitor stood her ground and is now mated to mr president and just laid her first two eggs so they're asking if the first lady would have flown far away to find another mate potentially out of state or if you think it's likely that she is still nearby but just kind of moved off to the side um yeah. and they said what distances do bald eagles range when they're not mated if you know yes yeah, so um it could be either in, in terms of the first lady. She could be she could be branching uh, somewhere nearby or in the area. Uh, she could have flown off uh, to look for another mate, and she might accompany that mate back to his nest uh, if he's if he has lost a mate. Um, that's not unusual for a younger bird to come in and fight. It's usually the males though that come in mm -hmm. and fight off the other male. We have a famous. Um, uh, bald eagle couple in Florida, um, uh, Harriet in M15. Well, Harriet once was mated with, uh, uh, guess who? Ozzy. And a younger bald eagle came in and uh, ultimately killed Ozzy. And Harriet took up with him immediately. And they've been together for, um, I think, uh, about eight years now. Mm. And uh, so it'd be interesting to see. I I'd be curious to know if, they if anybody's named the the, the, the new female eagle at the Arboretum. I was there last year, by the way, um, mm. checking out the nest. And it'll be curious to know if anybody has named the, I'm curious to know if they renamed or named that bird. Um, so as far as how far they fly, the juveniles tend to fly, which not surprisingly, uh, juveniles tend to fly, uh, migrate farther than the adults. Um, you know, the juveniles don't, they're not expert fishers yet. And so they depend on stealing and scavenging. Uh, and so say a Florida, uh, uh, a juvenile born in Florida, well, some will migrate as far north as Canada. Uh, mm. Same in Mississippi, they'll migrate as far north as Canada. Um, when they, as they get older, they become a little smarter and um, they tend to migrate shorter distances. Uh, sometimes um, a, bald, a bald eagle won't migrate out of its state at all. Uh, but sometimes it'll migrate some distances. Northern bald eagles between uh, breeding season migrate south, southerns migrate north. Um, a, a bald eagle from Saskatchewan will say migrate to Colorado. A Colorado bird will migrate to Saskatchewan. This is a trading place. Right. It's, <laughs> it's it's a crazy. There's a there's a nice little um, map migration map in my book that uh, somebody made for me that'll give you some sense of the randomness. Of, of their migration patterns or lack of pattern. Right. <laughs> migration chaos. Uh, but it's generally north and south. They generally do stay in their flyways though. So. Yeah, we um, at Hawk Mountain have like two surges of bald eagles that will come through mm -hmm. because they are kind of coming from different locations. So um, right. people always ask that, like, why are they coming at two separate times? But they're right. like a right, different right. group, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I have gotten quite a few questions about, um, lead poisoning in bald eagles. And I know that is a, um, continued issue. Um, I'll let you talk on this a little bit, but Hawk mountains, uh, we always recommend people considering switching to copper ammunition, yeah. um, because lead is unfortunately an ongoing issue for, um, bald eagles. If there's anything you wanted to add to that. Well, I mean, uh, folks may know that it's, it's, you know, even though the bald eagle population is thriving now, it doesn't mean there aren't, you know, dangers, uh, the continuing threats uh, to, to bald eagles, car strikes are one, air strikes, um, wind generators, although the, the, the um, um, electric power industry is really risen to the occasion is, and is experimenting with all sorts of technology and to try to reduce uh, bird kills, including bald eagle pit kills, and uh, Duke Energy with their wind site out in Wyoming, top of the hill, has had tremendous success with um, artificial and intelligence technology, uh, reducing um, uh, 
bald eagle and golden eagle deaths by something like 82 percent mm. uh, with this new technology and um but um and and then of course there's still the knuckleheads out there shooting them and um but uh, you know not not very many but lead is the the most is the greatest threat to bald eagles right now and mm. you know a, a shred of lead a a, a, a shard of lead the size of a, a grain of rice can kill a bald eagle. And um, it, you know, the, the, and I write about this in the book, the Obama administration um, uh, adopted a, a rule to uh, uh, forbid or, or, or uh, ban lead shot and bullets in national wildlife refuges and um, the, you know, encouraging hunters to convert to copper. And now hunters don't want to hurt these birds, you know, or any bird. They're, they're some of our best conservationists. And sometimes it's just, they don't realize that when they leave their gut pile uh, mm -hmm. out in the woods to, to recycle back into the environment and to feel the, to uh, feed the wildlife, they, many of them don't realize that they're killing it too. Right. And, um, and, but the, 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 um, the Donald Trump administration in the very early days uh, reversed that ban on uh, lead shot and bullets in national wildlife refuges. The Biden administration has not restored it. I'm hoping it will. Uh, I'm hoping that there's a campaign, just a uh, you know, voice campaign and publicity campaign around the country to encourage the hunters to, to um, you know, start using copper bullets. They're about 30% more expensive Right. Um, but it's not like you go out, a, a real hunter goes out and, you know, shoots a hundred rounds, uh, even in a season. Mm -hmm. uh, so we afforded the conversion to uh, away from leaded gasoline. We can afford this, I think. <laughs> it's good for us, too, because we're yeah. leading, you know, you, you take the venison home, you know, take the deer home and, you know, you serve it to your family, too. There can be lead in it. Mm -hmm. We had a... Um a in-person lecture, I think it was already last year now, talking about the lead poisoning and showing um, they would take x-rays of meat that people took home to feed to their families. Yeah. And you know, there are the traces of lead in it. So yeah. it, it definitely benefits everyone in the situation. I have uh, good friends in New Hampshire where I have a second home who uh, keep me well fed on venison uh, during the summertime, and I appreciate that they go out and hunt a uh, hunt every fall, and uh, they've assured me they're using only copper. I, I you know, I don't want to be absorbing any lead. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, all right, we do have a few more questions here, and update the um, the one female bald eagle that overtook the nest. They did name her earlier this year. Her name is Lady of the United States. So there you go. <laughs> Lady of the United States. Well, M15 <laughs> has never gotten the one uh, who took up with Harriet and killed yeah. Ozzy. Has never gotten a pet name. It's now it, it continues to go by its uh, fish and wildlife uh, designation. <laughs> That's funny. All right. So a couple more questions here. Denise asked, "Do you know how long?" immature eagles will stay with their parent uh, pair? Yes, they, so um, the parents leave the nest uh, early on when, the, when the, the eaglets are around, you know, four to six weeks of age to give them room because they're growing big and they've got to exercise. They're balancing, they're exercising the wings. The parents no longer stay in the nest, they'll branch, uh, but they'll continue to bring food to the nest um, and uh, to feed their young. And as I mentioned earlier, they fledge around uh, 12, 12 weeks and the, and the parents will continue. It's like, you know, it's like us keeping the refrigerator stock for our, our teenagers. Um, <laughs> they continue to bring food to the nest and usually around, you know, somewhere around 16 to 20 weeks, the, the, uh, the juvies will leave uh, the territory. And the, in some cases they'll branch a while for a week or two but then, but continue to go back to that refrigerator, meaning that nest, um, and then eventually leave the territory. And when they do, the parents will leave. Uh, and they, and again, the female will go her, her way, the male will go his way um, until they, they both return to the nest the next season. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, all right. So I wanted to 
Uh, and this is great timing. This question, I have so many questions here. Um, I'm not sure if we're able to get through all of them today, but um, if you would be able to, if, um, do you have an email that people could go and ask you additional questions? Would you wanna add that to the chat? The, um, oh yeah, uh, well, maybe you can add it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm probably incapable of it. Uh, so it's just Jack E. Davis, Jack with my uh, middle initial E. Davis, no period at Gmail. So Perfect. it's easy. Awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm going to be on the road for the entire month of March for a book tour. So uh, I may not be able to spawn uh, right away, uh, but, I, but eventually I'll, I'll, um, I'll answer your question if you email me. Awesome. There is one last question that I think would be a perfect wrap up. They said, this question is from Jim. They said, great new perspective. Can't wait to add it to my collection. Is the book available? Where can we find the book? Oh, anywhere, <laughs> everywhere. It, it, it was released March 1st. Um, you, can get, you can get it on onla, online booksellers. You can get it at your local bookstore. Uh, it's, um, um, yeah, it's, uh, you shouldn't have any problem uh, getting, getting a copy uh, whatsoever. Yeah. Perfect. Someone just said that it's on their Amazon wish list. Hint, hint for her husband. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jack. It was such a pleasure. And thank you everyone for being such a great audience, having so many awesome questions. Yes. Um, we have some upcoming stay at home speaker series in the upcoming weeks. Next week, we have one same day, same time um, about Peregrine Falcons with uh, Gilbert Myers. And we also have one, the a couple of weeks after that about James Bond and his um, unknown connection to Hawk Mountain. So thank you everyone so much for joining us, Jack. Thank you so much for My pleasure. speaking with us today. And yeah, have a great night, everybody. Yes, have a good night. Bye-bye.